All right. Ooh, that sounds way better. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'd like to call this uh, regular meeting of the City of Santa Cruz Planning Commission to order. Uh, Tess, can we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Conway? Here. Dan? Here. Gordon? Here. Kelvy? Here. Paul Hymas? Here. Thompson? Here. Here. Kennedy? Here. Um, I'd like to welcome our two new commissioners and ask if there's any statements of disqualification on the items on the agenda tonight. Seeing none, we'll move on to oral communications. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. Oral communications is a time to speak to us about items that are not on the agenda tonight. Would anyone like to come speak on some other item? All right, hearing none, I'll close oral communications and move on to the approval of minutes for January 18th, 2024. We have a motion to approve. Oh, I did have one comment. There was a, like just one sentence was repeated in oh. the condition of approval. It's just a typo. I will look. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I can dig it up. but. Um, it's pretty obvious. It just repeats the the, the sentence the twice. Was... Yeah, the one the ones we wrote in four, person. So. Yeah. I'll uh, I'll move the minutes. And I'll second. All those in favor of approving the minutes. Aye. 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 All right. So now we will move on to our one public hearing tonight. And uh, let's go ahead and hear the staff report on that item. Uh, welcome, Tim. Nice to see you again. Yeah, likewise. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so good evening, Chair Kennedy and members of the Planning Commission. Uh, my name is Tim Mayer, a senior planner with the city. This evening's agenda item is an application for renewal of the existing coastal development permit to allow for ongoing implementation of the city's oversized vehicle ordinance and safe parking program within the coastal zone. Staff requests that the Planning Commission consider approval of a coastal permit as follow-up to the California Coastal Commission's one-year approval of the existing coastal development permit. The proposed action would allow for ongoing implementation of the city's oversized vehicle ordinance, or OVO. Um, among other elements, the existing regulations prohibit parking citywide of oversized vehicles, or OVs, between the hours of midnight or 12 a.m. and 5 a.m. Also, they prohibit parking of unattached trailers and facilitate the city's safe parking program. Um, the actions for the Planning Commission's consideration this evening also accommodate potential future minor modifications to the city's safe parking program and oversized vehicle regulations, including, for example, potential revisions to its OV residential parking permit program. Uh, the proposed actions require approval of a new coastal development permit as required by the existing one-year coastal development permit set to expire on May 11th of 2024. <clears throat> The Oversized Vehicle Ordinance applies citywide. Um, implementation of the ordinance and associated programs are classified generally as development due to their capacity to affect access to the coast pursuant to the California Coastal Act, and they're therefore not exempt from the requirement for a coastal permit. Um, in this slide, the purple hatched areas show the portions of the land within the city limits of Santa Cruz which fall within the coastal zone. As visible on this map, many of the street segments available for public parking is shown in blue and green. Uh, facilitate access to the coast. This map is further divided in the next several slides into three subsections, including the far west side, lower west side, and wharf harbor river areas. This slide shows the area of the far west side of the city, um, which occurs within the coastal zone, again shown in purple hatched. This area extends north from the coast approximately two miles to lands administered by UC Santa Cruz and includes areas such as Natural Bridges, State Beach, and Antonelli Pond. Um, which contain environmentally sensitive habitat area, or ESHA, which serves as home to approximately a dozen special status species protected under the Federal Endangered Species Act. This slide depicts the areas of the lower west side within the coastal zone. Uh, this area extends from the shore approximately one mile inland and is more heavily urbanized, um, including residential areas and industrial sites, but also includes relatively undeveloped lands such as Lighthouse Field State Beach and Neary Lagoon. Um, the part of the city depicted on this slide includes the most extensively urbanized areas. It includes Municipal Wharf, San Lorenzo River, and Small Craft Harbor. It includes areas such as parts of Beach Flat and Lower Seabright. 
Uh, for over a decade, the city of Santa Cruz has pursued efforts aimed at attempting to mitigate and alleviate the sometimes adverse impacts of long-term parking of oversized vehicles. Through the OVO and associated programs, the city aims to balance community concerns regarding the effects of long-term parking of oversized vehicles with the protection of potentially vulnerable individuals, including occupants of oversized vehicles who may have limited access to proper housing. Staff request to continue implementation of the oversized vehicle ordinance, which among other elements prohibits parking of oversized vehicles as mentioned between the hours of midnight and 5 a.m. The proposed actions uh, this evening seek to reduce the impacts of parking of oversized vehicles, which are defined as motor vehicles exceeding 20 feet in length or 8 feet in width and 7 feet in height, along with unattached trailers on city streets. The city's oversized vehicle ordinance is codified in the city's municipal code, primarily in Title 10, Section 4, but also including municipal code, Title 16, um, Chapter 19, Section 70. This slide includes an overview of past permitting actions related to implementation of the oversized vehicle ordinance. The first version of the OVO was adopted in 2015. Since that time, numerous actions have been taken and hearings held which has led to ongoing refinement of regulations leading to this evening's public hearing. Documents attached to the staff report, which are numerous, provide detailed background information demonstrating the extensive efforts taken by the city to address the topic of homelessness and entrenchment of oversized vehicles. This slide over um, outlines the achievements made and milestones reached by the city to date in efforts to address homelessness and long-term parking on street of oversized vehicles. Uh, the city spearheads community engagement through action of a group of full-time staff dedicated to homelessness response and outreach, while staff across all city departments interact in various capacities to address the diverse aspects of services for the unhoused. Also, the city's Community Advisor Coalition on Homelessness, or CACH, composed of a volunteer task force of community and business partners, works to develop homelessness response solutions. Another major contribution is development of new housing, including affordable housing. The city's six cycle housing element was certified on time by the state's Department of Housing and Community Development, or HCD. The city has exceeded the minimum targets of housing production at all levels of affordability in its regional housing needs allocation or arena mandated by the state. The city has earned a HCD's pro-housing designation, earning the recognition as one of the only 30 jurisdictions statewide to receive that status. Uh, the city also coordinates with partner agencies and organizations to develop temporary shelter intending to satisfy the demand for those services and includes a number of transitional supportive housing, housing developments as listed on this slide. Uh, further, the city's safe parking program includes three tiers of progressively intensive support from single night emergency safe parking to 30 day overnight only parking and 24 seven long term parking with wraparound or comprehensive services which provides participants with designated parking spaces available 24 hours a day, as well as case management and housing navigation. The city additionally collaborates with the Association of Faith Communities, or AFC, which operates a safe spaces program that offers people living in their vehicles a place to park, along with access to sanitary facilities and other amenities to plan their next step toward better housing. That program currently serves approximately 40 people housed on faith community sites. As a component of entitlement of coastal development permit um, that exists, the Coastal Commission stipulated a number of conditions of approval required for permit renewal following the one year period of validity of the existing permit. Uh, this slide lists the conditions of approval of the existing coastal development permit imposed by the California Coastal Commission and the city's actions taken in response to those conditions of approval. In 2022, the City of Santa Cruz launched a three-year homelessness response action plan, which established a framework for public engagement that promotes enhanced community awareness and understanding of the city's oversized vehicle ordinance, which fulfills conditions of approval number three on this slide. City staff have prepared an oversized vehicle ordinance signage plan, satisfying condition of approval number four. Installation of that signage began in November of 2023 and was completed prior to the city's first day of enforcement of the OVO on December 4th of 2023. Uh, signs have been posted in main arteries serving as gateways to city limits and on certain city segments throughout the city which have in the past experienced high levels of oversized vehicle parking, which notifies the public to overnight vehicle parking restrictions and prohibition of parking on a, of unattached trailers on city streets. The city has prepared an OVO operations and management plan meeting condition of, of approval number five is shown on the slide. 
Uh, for condition of approval number six, staff has implemented a stakeholder group outreach plan and formed a 10 member stakeholder group with approximately equal representation by members of various unhoused advocates and oversized vehicle parking control advocates. The stakeholder group has convened on four separate occasions. Uh, the staff report prepared for this evening's hearing is expected to fulfill condition of approval number seven is listed here. This slide includes the range of oversized vehicle parking permits currently available. Uh, the permit program provides a variety of permits which allows for parking of OVs, including for residents, out-of-town guests, hotel patrons, as well as contractors. The program also includes a mechanism for issuance of parking permits for oversized vehicles to park on city streets if capacity in safe parking lots is exceeded, which is a circumstance that has not yet um, taken place. The coastal permit application under consideration this evening would allow for consideration for modification of the residential parking permit program to allow for parking by residents of an oversized vehicle on the street subject to specific criteria to be determined in the future should a proposed modification to the residential parking permit program be pursued. This slide presents information regarding the number of oversized vehicle parking permits and citations for violation of the OVO issue to date. As of January 30th, uh, 57 parking permits have been issued and 244 citations or parking tickets have been issued. Nearly half of those citations have been reduced to warnings as first-time violations, with others having been successfully appealed. According to information provided by enforcement officers, approximately half the citations were issued in the first several days following initiation of enforcement, which began again on December 4th of 2023. The overall trend toward declining citation <coughs> issuance over time indicates a growing public awareness of the program and increasing compliance with overnight parking restrictions. Um, through anecdotal observations, information available to city staff reveals that the OVO and associated safe parking program implementation have resulted in positive environmental outcomes and public access benefits. City staff have received feedback from members of the public, including OVO advocates, uh, which participate on the stakeholder outreach group, that overall OV entrenchment has diminished and impacts associated with long-term oversized vehicle stays in areas such as Delaware Avenue, where entrenchment was previously common and where sensitive environmental habitat is prevalent, have significantly declined. Um, these observations represent reasonably anticipated outcomes of implementation of the city's safe parking program and enforcement of a prohibition on overnight parking of oversized vehicles in the public right away. In addition, informal accounts from homelessness response field crews who regularly patrol areas frequented by the unhoused, including dwellers of oversized vehicles, have corroborated anecdotal reports of the success of enforcement efforts. Staff has received a range of feedback from members of the public related to the OVO and safe parking program. Uh, members of the public have offered a number of suggestions and requests following several, uh, following several general themes. Um, these requests include allowance of on-street parking for unattached trailers, a request that neighborhoods be able to opt out of OV prohibitions, and request to expand the 24-7 safe parking program. The first two suggestions listed here would necessitate official action by the City Council for implementation, while the third suggestion acknowledges the nature of demand for expansion of comprehensive homelessness services, but which involves practical difficulties associated with siting of additional suitable 24-7 safe parking, along with acquisition of funding not yet identified to defray the costs associated with an expansion of the City's existing 24-7 safe parking program. The proposed coastal permit application conforms to relevant regulations and provides for consistency with goals and policies of the city's local coastal program, reinforcing protection of environmental resources and advancing public health and safety while facilitating ongoing access to the coast. The program pro promotes the city's uh, health and all policies or high objectives, uh, promoting equity, public health, as well as sustainability. Further, the continued implementation of its oversized, the city's oversized vehicle programs does not constitute a project under CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, and even if it were considered a project, would remain exempt via both statutory and categorical exemptions. Following preparation of the staff report and through consultation with the city attorney's office and staff of the Coastal Commission, staff have revised um, two conditions of approval as listed in the staff report and have included several others in the next several slides. Uh, as shown on this slide, a revision to condition of approval number five 
related to minor modifications to implementation of the OVO and safe parking program appears here. Um, and in italicized text um, includes standard language included by um, the California Coastal Commission, which allows for minor modifications, not prompting issuance of new coastal permits. Condition of approval number six, as included in the staff report, indicates required compliance with the existing coastal development permit and its, and its conditions of approval. However, as that coastal permit will be replaced by the permit under consideration this evening, and because many of the conditions of approval of the existing CDP refer to requirements associated with a one-year expiration, condition of approval number six, as shown here, has been replaced um, with the text um, listed on this slide, which emphasizes ongoing compliance with plans which remain in effect, such as the OVO communications and outreach plan, operations and management plan, as well as the signage plan. The first new uh, suggested condition of approval, which is unnumbered, would provide a mechanism for ongoing collection of public feedback, which would be provided um, to the Coastal Commission staff upon request, allowing for ongoing review of the success of the city's safe parking program. Can you Could come you? back and just pause on that one? Sure. So I can Absolutely. finish reading it. Um, just as a quick note, um, a hard copy of these revisions have been provided to the commissioner. This is a desk item. But happy to pause and um, Thank you. go back if necessary. Okay. okay. The new condition of approval listed here indicates that the application under consideration will remain valid for five years with subsequent review of program success by the planning director and the Coastal Commission Executive Director. And more than us, I was just feeling there might be people here in the audience who hadn't oh, you know, absolutely. got a copy and, and would need time to take a look at these slides. I'm happy to you know, go back and mm -hmm. um, show these slides as well. Um, also, feedback received from the stakeholder outreach group of last evening's meeting um, has additionally informed staff's recommendations. Included on the next several slides are recommendations for conditions of approval as suggested by OVO stakeholder group members. And this is the first of several. Um, this includes a new condition of approval requiring that the city conduct a point in time or pit count on an annual basis. And that would be a uh, tally of the uh, number of oversized vehicles um, found parked on city streets. The next condition of approval, again suggested by the OVO stakeholder um, group, provides an opportunity for potential enrollees in the safe parking program to be provided an opportunity to, feedback, to provide feedback regarding improvement of the safe parking program and to identify services that would provide assistance to them. And the uh, further, another condition of approval um, suggested by the stakeholder outreach group. Um, includes that the city collect qualitative and as feasible quantitative data, which will assist in assessment of the effectiveness of the oversized vehicle ordinance and safe parking program in alleviating the adverse environmental and health and safety impacts of entrenchment of oversized vehicles. Um, staff recommends that the proposed revisions and additions to the conditions of approval compared to those included in the staff report be considered for approval by the Planning Commission incorporation in the coastal development permit application under consideration this evening again i'm happy to um, reverse the slides if necessary if, um, any commissioners or members of the public would like to review the text no i think that's good we might have some more okay. questions for you if everyone's feeling comfortable with it okay. great uh, staff have made the findings to support the proposed coastal development permit application with revisions to the conditions of approval as included in the previous several slides. And staff recommends that the Planning Commission acknowledge the environmental determination and move to approve the request for the coastal development permit based upon the findings included in the conditions of approval attached to the staff report with the revisions as noted. 
Uh, staff uh, are available to answer questions related to any topic discussed and to provide additional information as needed. Uh, thank you very much. This concludes staff presentation. So I'm going to jump in with one quick one and then I'll uh, pass it around. Lee, did you have something to say before that? Yes, thanks, Chair Kennedy. Uh, Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development. I wanted to make one clarification in response to the presentation. A couple of the slides had maps um, that were used from the uh, prior version of the oversized vehicle ordinance, which had in it a provision that prohibited um, oversized vehicle parking within 100 feet of intersections to promote um, visibility around those intersections. We have removed that. And because we recycled those maps in this presentation, they popped back up. Um, I just wanted to be clear for the members of the commission and members of the public that that is not a part of the proposal. You don't see it in, in the conditions of the staff report, but it appeared here. So I just wanted to state that so that there isn't any confusion. While we're there, I feel like I should know this. Can you remind me why the coastal zone goes so far inland um, on that map one? Sure, on the western side, it's it's primarily because uh, that is open space okay. and sensitive habitat is um, is a large part of that area. Part of our green belt, if I remember right. That's correct. More so than like being a certain number of feet from the shoreline, et cetera. Okay. Right, yeah, it, it varies actually up and down the coast. It varies substantially between urbanized areas and non-urbanized areas. Um, you know, in, in Big Sur, for example, it can be all the way up to the first ridge line. Sweet. Um, so, the, the distance um, varies considerably. Thanks. As you can see here. Which doesn't apply anymore, but just to be clear. Okay. So then I just, it's kind of a question, but I want to point out that some of those new, or clarify, some of those new conditions came out of a public meeting that was held last night. I just want to say that because we're in this crazy pace to hear from everybody and keep everything moving. Excuse me. Uh, we're in this crazy pace to hear from everybody and also keep this moving. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. And um, uh, that's why we're seeing them up here on paper for the first time. Um, other questions from the commission? For staff. Is there, uh, in tier three, the 24 seven, is it 24 seven something or is it 24 seven forever? I couldn't get the actual language of the ordinance from the PDFs that were posted, so I'm just wondering if there's a... Come on up. I think any one of us could handle that, but Larry <laughs> is our homelessness response manager, Larry M. Wally. Go right ahead. If, sorry. Good evening, commissioners. Larry M. Wally, homelessness response manager for the city of Santa Cruz. The Tier 3 program is a 24-7 program that is minimally six months uh, for participants. It involves case management, housing navigation as part of the program. There are extensions possible through conversation with the case managers, so there could be two extensions up to a full year for participants, but it's not um, in perpetuity for each individual. Thank you. And then secondly, um, does anyone know if there is still an RV dump station at the harbor? There used I, to be one in the lower harbor, and then I think I saw documentation that there's one in the lower in the upper harbor. Uh, mm -hmm. Lieutenant Carter Jones, uh, I oversee the homelessness response team and OVO staff from the law enforcement side. Uh, we actually checked in with the harbor to see if that could be a potential dumping station. It is small and outdated, and so they're barely making that work in the harbor for boats and stuff, let alone us being able to use it for RV access and so for us. Okay, it just struck me that it's such a marginal additional use that that might be a possibility. I'm not sure if it's a if it's a tank that gets emptied or whether they've devised some crazy septic system next to the harbor or what the... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know the logistics is, but on I, it. I, I do think that there's discussion in a lot of the documents about trying to get the county to participate in this process. And that seems like it would be a very, you know, minimal investment on their part to try to expand that. So. 
Thank you. Um, I just had a quick question about the condition, the new conditions of approval. So we've revised five and six, and it looks like the first new one, if we're following the order here, would be 10. Yes? Is that kind of what we're thinking? Yeah, provision for mechanism of feedback, that would be 10, 11, 12, so on and so forth. Um, are those already considered to be added, or do we have to make a motion to add them, or are they considered pretty much already in there? They, they would be brand new conditions of approval, so there need to be a motion made. Okay, thank you. It, it would. It, they are part of staff recommendation. So if you're moving staff staff recommendation, they would be inherently included. But you know, for clarification purposes, you can certainly include that. And um, while you're asking about those, I think one thing that I'd like to um, highlight about these is um, these were not. Um, expressly identified as these should be conditions as part of the discussion in the meeting last night. I just want to be clear. They stemmed from issues that we heard. So for example, we heard that um, there was a desire to have a better understanding of the impacts to the individuals and how we can help the individuals um, move into improved living situations. And so we uh, included conditions like this that um, we are already doing some of these things, like um, asking what type of uh, services may be beneficial to those individuals upon intake, or um, and we've got a feedback mechanism for how to um, provide um, recommendations to the city on how things could be improved. But this really um, acknowledges that and formalizes it so that it will um, continue on an ongoing basis. And it also, um, in the second part here, allows for that stakeholder group, as, as we are finding value from it, and you know, even last night, um, immediately before this meeting, you know, fourth meeting, we're, we're still getting good information. And um, through that, um, we would continue to have um, those conversations with individuals who are both um, supportive of the oversized vehicle ordinance and opposed to uh, the oversized vehicle ordinance and then we can make modifications to the permit as Tim discussed over time in order to um, respond to those awesome and then just to uh, one more just to clarify and so staff is recommending all of these some of them came out of the stakeholder group some of them are just problems that you think need to be addressed that's correct we staff are recommend is recommending yes, all of them. indeed got it thank you Oh, that's a good clarification that through the process it just finished last night so mm -hmm. this is the end result rather than frantically typing them at the last minute uh, Julie yeah thank you um, and thank you for the report it is a lot um, and the other thing I have to say having watched this over it seems like a lot of years it is getting better it is really a lot better I think in terms of what it's providing and more robust and and that kind of thing and I, I I think that it shows some determination to continue to make it better and I'm glad to see that I did have a couple of questions um, and uh, around um, funding for staffing and also around um, the pit count um, so one of the question is I'm glad to see that there's a pit count happening and I'm wondering um, there was some indication that the standards are they are there are you using HUD rules um, on those standards? Is, that, is it being carried out? We've got this huge, extensive, really a lot of work method that is has one goal. This seems like it's different than that. And I'm just wondering um, who's conducting the pit count? Um, how is it being done? Uh, and um, you know who's overseeing it? Sure, I'm happy to speak to that. And then I'll welcome anyone else that would like to add more. Um, so we have conducted one pit count of oversized vehicles, um, and um, we did not follow the, the standard methodology. The standard methodology, um, when I've been out to do the pit count, just identifies whether or not people are residing in their vehicles. It doesn't distinguish between a regular size vehicle and an oversized vehicle. Um, so we sought to... Um, to send teams of two individuals out to drive every single street in the city. And um, then um, we marked on our worksheet whether or not there was an oversized vehicle. We, we identified whether it was a uh, unattached trailer, which are also prohibited by the ordinance. Um, and we also marked, it's 
it's hard to tell whether someone is residing in a vehicle or not, but um, you know, we, we made a best guess based on um, the appearance of the vehicle. Oftentimes, you know, windows will be fogged early in the morning, which is a good indicator. And so um, we did that. Um, we don't have a, uh, we haven't had an opportunity to do a follow-up. So, you know, one point in time count is not particularly useful in that it, it doesn't show a trend or a pattern, but we were able to uh, do that in advance of the um, implementation of the oversized vehicle ordinance. And so what we're trying to do is break it down so that we can um, have a little bit more information than, uh, and, and certainly more information than what we would do during the, the typical um, point in time count because we're focused on oversized vehicles. Um, so we, we did not go out and measure um, that would have been quite labor intensive, but um, we did um, have a category of um, definitely an oversized vehicle. You know, some are very clear if it's 30 feet long. Um, and then we had, you know, well, we're not sure we're going to have it in a, as a suspected oversized vehicle. Um, and so um, the thought is uh, that we would do that um, over time. Um, and we've got in here that we would be doing it at least once a year so that we can. Um, provide so that we can have additional data to inform both the safe parking program as well as the future implementation of the oversized vehicle ordinance. Mm -hmm. All right, so you'll have some over time, you'll be able to watch some changes. Um, and who's participating in the pit count? Um, it was all city staff the last time. Um, so I think. Gavin, I don't know that you were there, but the rest of the, uh, Larry was there, Susie was there, um, just some of the folks in the audience, myself, uh, Lisa Murphy, our deputy city manager. Um, and so, uh, and we had several members of our um, outreach, our homelessness response outreach team um, who participated. So we broke up the city in groups. I know uh, we spent three hours doing it. it it's uh, a lot of driving. It was like driving to Sacramento. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so, um, and thank you for that, because I know it's a big effort to do it, and I do see that there's some value in, you know, collecting data over time, and, um, and I just wondered if you were doing what, um, you know, the COC recommends, which is having um, a person who's experiencing homelessness participate, um, and uh, that's, which I think has a lot of value also. Um, not that easy to do. I, I appreciate that. Um, so it's also as far as the other the rest of the data collections. That's also that's um, your the um, department is doing it or who's who's collecting that data. So there was another condition of approval regarding uh, data collection, and one of the things that we and if you want to, it would be helpful. One of the things that um, we have um, observed specifically, we have a, a team that does um, the cleanup of areas and they've got routes where you know they know there are hot spots and, and they go and do cleanups um, that team has indicated that there has been a substantial reduction in trash and refuse removal in the vicinity of antonelli pond on delaware and natural bridges and of course you know that's got sensitive habitat out there um, as tim mentioned 12 special status species of one sort or another and so um, that is an area of concern when it comes to environmentally sensitive habitat that, that could be affected by substantial amounts of, of litter and refuse. And so um, we are uh, looking to see how we can quantifiably um, and how we can quantify that. Um, and so Public Works, to get to your question, Public Works, um, that field crew resides in Public Works and they do that, um, that pickup. And there are, they're counting the number of bags that they they pick up. Um, it's it's more challenging for them to um, get the specific weight because they're hitting a lot of different spots. Um, but they're able to count the number of bags that they're collecting. And so I think you know we'll we'll look at how we can refine that based on the the data that we're getting. Um, but certainly you know the, the qualitative analysis thus far has been that. Um, a lot less trash, a lot fewer um, large items like like couches and, and chairs and things. And so um, from that perspective, there has been a, a significant benefit from uh, waste reduction that 
is improperly disposed of. Okay, sorry about all the questions. No. Um, um, I have one more um, for now, which is about funding for the um, supportive services programs. Um, these are, is it, it's um, city programs that are, um, or city funding that's going to the, um, the free guide and the AFC, all the different programs? That's, that's correct. So um, in next year's proposed budget, assuming that this um, is um, ultimately approved, um, in next year's proposed budget, we have, I believe it's $570,000 um, proposed to uh, primarily go to the 24-7, but also to support the um, overnight only um, safe parking. Um, and then um, you mentioned the AFC. Um, that's actually separately funded through the core process. And so um, we provide funding to CORE that is funneled through the county, and then the county combines that money, um, and then the county contracts with the county contracts directly with um, AFC. Yeah, I understand that the funding is really complicated, and there's a, there's a lot of streams coming in, and um, it isn't always up to the city about what gets funded, um, especially if you're tapping into any of the HUD funding. Um, any state program, so it's it's kind of it's kind of complicated. Um, but my my question was really about um, I guess what was driving it is just a concern that there's um, steady funding and adequate funding um, to make sure that the program can be you know successful. People can be successful. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know that is certainly a a real challenge because uh, you know that's a, a significant amount of money and. Um, I will say that, um, particularly when it comes to the 24-7, um, there are good outcomes, right? And, and the costs that we are um, putting towards uh, the 24-7 program is um, yielding good outcomes for, for the money that we're spending. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, you know, we're, we're hopeful that we'll be able to continue that, but um, you know, there are always budget challenges, and um, so we, we make proposals, and, and um, sometimes things have to be reduced. And, you know, in this instance, we are um, anticipating that, you know, we're, we're making that request. It's the council's ultimate decision as to whether or not they're, they're funding programs and at, at what level. Thanks. Any, any other questions? Mine is kind of like a big one. It's, um, I go to a lot of public meetings. I haven't been to many on this issue. And I recognize concern about that being a rich process. And I see tons of really good documentation of this. But I wanted to ask, like, in your opinion, has that been a really good back and forth process with everyone being heard? I can't, I can't say compare it to something else because it's super unique, this whole thing that we're working on. but. What do you think? What's your gut? Like, I don't want to hear about four meetings, but do you feel like <laughs> communication is happening? Or is it kind of rough? Or what's your feeling about it? Um, so um, the stakeholder meetings, I, I do think there's value in the stakeholder meetings. Um, you know, there are diverse opinions on, at those stakeholder meetings, uh, and intentionally so, right? There are five members who are supportive and five members who are not. And so, um, you know, that um, that does... It can present tension, um, but I think it's been respectful throughout the process, and um, we um, we've gotten a lot of good feedback from the individuals and appreciate appreciate their participation. There are a number of them in the audience here who participated, um, as well as uh, the staff members here. You know, have uh, all participated at one point or another in those meetings. Um, there have also been I should have counted this, but I believe it's been about eight uh, public hearings on this mm -hmm. at this point. Um, and so um, there have been a, a lot of members of the public who have written in, um, less who have, have um, called in and spoken, but still substantial numbers of people that, um, that participated um, through those public hearing processes, starting with the city council and then back through the Zoning Administrator and Planning Commission and City Council and Coastal Commission and Coastal Commission. Okay. Yeah, there have been a lot of hearings. <laughs> <laughs> That's the answer I was expecting, but I just wanted to phrase it that way. Sure. 
Because, you know, tall buildings are one thing, but this is some really tough communication. On the, I mean, in my experience in our community, these are hard things to work on. So then my last question is more like kind of technical. It, you know, this uh, dance with the Coastal Commission, we have conditions of approval and all this, but we also want to be responsive and change, you know, as we get more data and learn. So could you, like, explain to layman, like, when it reaches the point where you have to go back and ask permission again and re-trigger that process? Um, sure. I know that's kind of hard, and there's a lot of very complicated technical conditions, but I just, I want to be responsive, but I, I also know we have to follow those rules. So can you speak to that? Sure. So the way the latest condition is worded, um, it would, um, assuming that we, um, it, it's, it's approved tonight, um, we would um, have the oversized vehicle ordinance in, uh, in effect in the coastal zone for five years. Mm -hmm. At that time, we would be um, providing a report to the uh, Coastal Commission, and um, they would actually have the authority to extend the permit or to um, have us need to go back through another either modification or a new coastal permit. Um, they could all are kind of communicating at the staff level yes throughout that and saying hey would this be okay and getting recommendations and things any modifications there's a separate condition in there that says um, any modifications for example um, the commission when we were there brought up a residential parking and that residential parking permit um, was something that we discussed with the stakeholder group it's something that we heard um, I believe we had you know, about eight or so complaints come in from people who have oversized vehicles as their daily driver, but may not have a place where they can park that vehicle. And so um, we included in here the anticipated approach that you know, we might have a change such as that. And um, we haven't gone through all of those criteria yet to dial them in specifically, but changes like that, we could, in that particular one, we would need to adopt an ordinance um, through the city council to allow for that uh, new type of parking permit. And um, in doing so, we would be coordinating with the Coastal Commission to make sure that we're not doing something that is going to create concerns from their perspective about uh, impacts to coastal resources. Great. Well said. Those are my questions. Um, good. If there's no more questions, we will um, open up the public hearing to hear from the public. Next. So I just want to show hands how many folks are here and want to speak with us. Um, all right, seeing that, let's do three minutes for each speaker. Uh, before we open up the mic, and we do want to hear from you all, I just wanted to clarify that we did have some last minute emails coming in. There was one that got a very thorough staff response that came in today, or the response came in today, and several other late breaking ones. So again, I just wanted to acknowledge staff's effort in providing these really quick, you know, as, as things were coming in, even up to emails received today. Um, so I wanted to point that out, that we have all these. Did everyone get a chance to see those and, and page through them? Cool. I want to make sure that all that public comment was received. Um, great. So come on up. I think everyone knows the rules. If you don't mind, put your name in the uh, log over there. That way Tess can spell your name correctly. And um, come on up. We'd like to hear what you have to say. Hello, um, here we are again. My name is Reggie Meisler. I'm a member of Santa Cruz Cares. I attended the first two stakeholder meetings. Um, and I think since it's been like two years since we've talked about this issue locally. So I think it's important to kind of reorient again to like what we're really talking about here. Because whenever we bring up OVO, it seems like we talk about safe parking at the same time. But OVO, does not define, does not create, does not regulate, does not fund safe parking. Safe parking was created before OVO was even put forward. And so if we get rid of OVO, we do not lose safe parking. Uh, though the city staff may suggest 
that because Depot Park, which is technically tier two, is in the coastal zone, that that is why we might need a permit for safe parking. But the truth is, is that the act of just not ticketing people for parking somewhere overnight is not a coastal program. <laughs> like, it's just not doing a thing, right? So you don't need a permit program to let someone park somewhere overnight without ticketing them. And I also want to note that Santa Cruz Cares did three different point in time counts and we told city staff we were doing them in stakeholder meetings and yet no one seems to know about this. So I think that kind of goes to show that that, that lack of collaboration was kind of rooted from the beginning of this process. And finally, let me just sum up what the primary coastal access issue for you is gonna be here, which is that when the Coastal Commission forced the city to remove daytime parking restrictions, this was not something the city just opted to do. The ACLU found that daytime parking restrictions in the original OVO resulted in over 53% of public parking in the coastal zone being unusable by oversized vehicles. And so they considered that a public access issue. Well, based on testimonies from proponents of OVO, as well as evidence we've collected from our point in time counts, it is clear that the enforcement of OVO has resulted in over 90 or 70 to 90% of oversized vehicles no longer parking in coastal areas during the day, which demonstrates a greater public access threat than the original daytime parking restrictions posed. So that's the situation that you guys are gonna deal with if you try to pass this and then we appeal it up to the Coastal Commission. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joy Schendeldecker. Um, I'm also a member of Santa Cruz Cares. And um, it's, I'm really, thank you for your work and I appreciate seeing some of the ad uh, additions to the proposal um, because some of those were along the lines of things that I would um, suggest. First, let me just say I am still opposed to OVO and tying services to any sort of policing of communities. I believe those are separate issues and we, I think the, the city showed that um, one could stand up effective programs that can be scaled up and work with community groups um, in the time before OVO was enforced. Um, so I think framing is really important in this. Um, another framing issue that strikes me is that um, with all due respect to <laughs> the sort of verbiage that's common, um, preventing entrenchment, the inverse of that is forced itinerancy. And so we are seeing a kind of forced itinerancy even with the services that we have. It's in fact baked into some of our services. Um, one thing that the ACLU stakeholder brought up and I had brought up a bit too, I, I was able to attend two stakeholder meetings which I found really helpful and productive in some ways. Um, the data that I'm interested in, of course, as somebody who's like really interested in environmental issues and climate justice, I'm concerned also with pollution um, and plastics in our environment and toxins. But I'm more interested in the data collection of the people who are not being served by the safe parking programs. We think that about 60 vehicles have basically disappeared from the radar we don't know, we, we, we surmise that they're in the neighborhoods. They've, they're you know, relocating and they're, they haven't left the city because we have found a similar number of vehicles <laughs> overall, but we don't know who is where and we don't know what the effects on them are because we haven't talked to them, we haven't gathered the data. And um, this was something that the ACLU stakeholder was bringing up too, we just don't know and in the report, you'll see repeatedly that there's anecdotal evidence that we think we know what's happening. And in the stakeholder meetings too, 
um, outreach workers think that they know where people are going, or at least some people are going during the day when they're not in the overnight safe parking. Some of them are paying to stay there, and some of them are going, thought, you know, please. who knows where. So that's, I took too long saying those points. Okay. So I just, the one last point that I want to bring up, you get me started, um, is that I would like I would recommend that, the, that it's only a one-year renewal because I think two months of this program being in effect and the stakeholder meetings just getting to the point where we can productively talk to each other, I would say a one-year renewal and four stakeholder meetings would be much more comfortable for me in terms of accountability, transparency, and building what can be really productive conversations between people who have been fighting bitterly over this issue. Thank you so much. Thanks. Good evening. My name is Jasmine Mia, and I'm also a member of Santa Cruz Cares. I urge you to deny the coastal development permit for the oversized vehicle ordinance. Santa Cruz Cares has already provided arguments that the OVO has reduced coastal access, as evidenced by less RVs on Delaware even in the day, and has been done with discriminatory enforcement, again, by impacting mostly the Delaware area. I also want to echo that safe parking and services are separate from the OVO, meaning we don't need the OVO to offer services. I want to focus on what message the OVO sends to our community. I have heard from unhoused people that they feel unfairly targeted with this ordinance, and I would have to agree. We even heard tonight that a proposed revision of OVO includes a modification for residents. Thus, it seems pretty clear that the OVO was written mainly to deter people from living on the streets. In fact, I saw in the public correspondence a plea to restrict parking of any sized vehicles overnight. Do you see how OVO can set a precedent of banning unhoused people who sleep in their vehicles, period? And what does that say about how we show care in our community? Many unhoused members were born here or have lived here for a long time. Some are students and many work. We all know rents are astronomical here, with Santa Cruz being one of the highest rental markets in the whole country. So if people need to live in their vehicles, please let them. Space rent at RV parks is unreasonably high, and so people can't always afford that. I want to live in a society where we have a safety net for people who can't earn enough money to meet their basic needs. That's also a principle of disability justice. Not everyone can earn a wage that will let them live. So please join me in working towards creating that society with decisions like this by denying this coastal development permit. Thank you. Thank you. All right, would anyone else like to speak to this issue? All right, with that, I'll, I'll close the public comment period and uh, bring this item back up to the commission for a motion further discussion. Hear what's on everyone's minds. I'll just reiterate that I think it would be great if some of the logistical issues <clears throat> that would make the program more successful, like the uh, a dump site that could be easily and perhaps freely accessible to people uh, living in RVs, could be worked into the discussions with the county. I think that there are probably more than one location where that might be able to be launched. And I think uh, some of the, that's not the only logistical issue, obviously, but I think that it, it would be great to try to get them participating in this in a way that maybe they're not now. Um, to address, sorry, your name, Joy's uh, mentioning a one year since we've been doing this for a couple months and um, we have limited um, information, but some. Um, where, I guess I'm curious where the five year came from, like as a, as a frame. So let me start that by addressing the one year. <clears throat> um, I think there were 38 attachments to this. Right. <laughs> report um, somewhere on the order, you know, well over a thousand pages, I believe, uh, all in total. 
Um, and you know, the, the staff report itself was what, 20 some pages. Um, there is a substantial amount of work that goes into this, uh, this a hearing like this. And um, when the Coastal Commission uh, approved a single year, um, I did have concerns because particularly with the way they uh, approved it, um, requiring uh, a pre-approval of a number of plans, um, and then we'd had we have a lead time on you know manufacture of signage after those plans are approved and so forth. You know, we knew that we were going to be in a, a crunched uh, time frame. Um, the so so. One year happens very, very fast, and there's a lot of work that um, would need to go into um, uh, a uh, renewal after one year. Um, so then it becomes, you know, all right, well, what is a reasonable time frame? And um, when we've got a program that um, is in, in which any changes are being reviewed by the Coastal Commission to ensure that they are not creating coastal impacts, then um, we should be in a place where um, we are not um, creating impacts because of those changes. So the five years essentially came from coordination with the Coastal Commission to understand what is a reasonable time frame for review? Um, what um, would allow for implementation for a significant period of time that um, allows us to study the effects and um, provide that, that feedback and then have the opportunity for that to be continued if there are not coastal resource impacts. So that's that's essentially how um, we were contemplating it in coordination with the Coastal Commission to understand um, what um, would allow for you know, a, a return on the significant investment that the city has made, um, but also provide checks and balances so that if there are issues, there will be an opportunity to address them. Thank you. Sure. Um, and thanks for that answer, and I really do appreciate how the incredible amount of work it is, you know, for you guys too. Um, we've done a lot of reading. <laughs> I'm kidding, I know it's a lot of work. On the other hand, um, I think the points that a couple of people who spoke brought up um, are really good points. The, the fact that everybody is saying you've been having stakeholder meetings with people with really different, very strong feelings, um, and that you're reporting that they're productive, that the, the program is getting better. And I, th I think it's getting better because of engagement and some, some really solid effort. Um, obviously, um, city staff is working hard to make it better. Um, and it's, you know, uh, pe housed people in neighborhoods, I think, are feeling like it's getting better and we're making progress. Um, and uh, so I guess to um, follow uh, Timory's point, I think, is that um, having some pressure um, I don't think it should be every year, and I don't necessarily think it should be shorter than five years, but I like the idea that there's ongoing reporting about it. Um, without having it come as a whole big agenda packet, I would love to know that there's um, some opportunity to report out on it. Maybe it shows up in some of the regular work that the homeless team is working on. Um, but I, I like that idea, because I think talking together is gonna continue to make it better. All right, nicely said. I have like a general comment, but I feel like we should get a motion. If someone would like to make one. Can you talk a little bit more? I'll talk a little bit more then, fine. Uh, <laughs> this is a huge one for me. I mean, my <laughs> data point on this is related to my own life 
and it's going to the homeless garden project, which I've supported like since I was a kid and taking my kids who are three and eat out there to get our farm box, you know, when it's farm season. And so just seeing that through the years, kind of how that neighborhood with everyone living there has kind of risen and fallen. And I have to say, I had not super high hopes of this working that quickly, but on my little path out there on Delaware, it seems to really be working. Acknowledging I'm not seeing the whole city or where anyone went, but um, I just want to say bravo. I mean, this is like all the city departments working together on something super darn hard. So, you know, it's not perfect yet, but keep it up. And like, they think the volume of pages is kind of a proxy for how much work, energy, and heart has gone into this. So um, I really salute that. And um, yeah, I mean, my opinion is, is we should move this ahead and, and keep working on it and keep perfecting it and keep having those hard conversations. But um, it was, it stirred me to like just walk down Delaware yesterday and be like, oh my gosh, you know, this is way better. And I don't know, I have my little viewpoint on the world, which certainly has its own blinders, but I hope it's better for everyone out there and hope it keeps getting better for everyone. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. Um, I just had a question. Um, is there anything, I don't remember seeing this, but is there anything baked into just the general OVO process about reporting back to council on ongoing progress or data or anything like that? So I don't think there's something specifically in the oversized vehicle ordinance. However, we have done regular um, homelessness response updates, um, and um, we have also you know, provided regular updates uh, so far this year with respect to um, the oversized vehicle ordinance implementation, both um, internally as well as to some of our partners, like the county, for example. Um, some of the folks, uh, some of the team members here could speak to the regularity of the um, homelessness response reports and um, the, um, the OVO specific reports, um, if you'd like. With Larry, how often we're going to council these days <laughs> on that. I think that's once a year now. Good evening again, commissioners. Yes, um, we had been in a quarterly cycle initially with our general updates on homeless response to the council. Um, but as we've been implementing our homeless response action plan and doing it with that kind of periodicity, um, our reports now are a little more infrequent, whether it's once or twice a year in terms of formal presentations to the council. What we are doing on an ongoing basis is having a twice a month communication internally updating on all our division's activities to the council, and it always includes uh, progress with the, you know, related to safe parking and the implementation of the oversized vehicle ordinance. We've also done community meetings. So back, I think it was September 13th or 16th, we did a community webinar to folks where we're giving an update about where we are with our homeless response action plan and detail the progress and status of the implementation of the safe parking programs. Great, and um, I, I believe I read in the staff report there is a subcommittee for the OVO on council, yes? There is a council subcommittee. It's um, Vice Mayor Golder, Council Member Kalantari Johnson, and uh, Council Member uh, Bruner. Okay. okay, great. We, we do coordinate with them on uh, a regular basis to give them updates on our progress and um, convene them from time to time as well, particularly as uh, any significant milestones are coming up. Right. No, I mean, it sounds great. I think biannual progress reports and ongoing communication with the subcommittee is, is for me, I think that's okay. I don't know how other people feel about reporting out. I think that's a lot. <laughs> so thank you. Was the safe parking program prior to OVO, was that institutionally supported by any kind of city added infrastructure, um, porta potties, waste uh, facilities, anything like that? I'm only asking because it, it seems to me my kind of 
memory going through the following this process is that this is like the first time the city has affirmatively taken a step to allow people to camp to be on the to live in vehicles on the street it's always been a it's always been a ban before that and I'm, I'm not sure if that's technically correct but i'd be curious to know uh, thank you for the question. I can speak to how we've implemented the safe parking programs. So um, as, as you know from the, the information of the staff report and this whole process, there's a three-tier safe parking, three-tiered safe parking program that's been implemented. The tier two overnight um, has uh, hygiene and sanitation infrastructure at each of the sites. Uh, the program started, it was either the last week of February or March 1st of 2022, so about a year and a half um, or more prior to the actual implementation and enforcement of the Oversized Vehicle Ordinance. The Tier 3 program, which is the 24-7 program with staffing, including case management, housing, navigation, began in August of 2022, so again, you know, a year plus before the implementation of the program. So those were in place well before this ordinance, um, and again, the tier three as well has the hygiene and sanitation infrastructure as well as the services and staffing to support. Yeah, I'm, I was actually trying to distinguish between safe parking, which I, I believe did exist before OVO was a gleam in anyone's eye, and whether there were institutional supports for that, because that was mostly on private property, am I correct? Yeah, I, I was can not speak to right. that. I so, see. Yeah, so we had um, in our ordinance a provision that allowed for uh, I believe it was three vehicles to park on religious assembly sites right and I believe it was two excuse me one vehicle on a business site um, and we um, increased that um, in 2022 early yeah, <laughs> I think it was um, 2021. In, in actually, 2021. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. yes. So um, it, we we increased that um, to allow for up to six vehicles on religious uh, assembly use sites, and um, I believe it's three vehicles on a commercial business site. Those require no permits, um, so they can just go and do it as long as. Um, they are not creating any impacts with respect to nuisance issues or sanitation. So in that respect, the city code has supported that type of activity. And I'll note when we made those changes and increases, we also allowed for um, expanded abilities for individuals to reside in a recreational vehicle on private property, like in someone's driveway, for example. So we expanded that. Um, so. The city has supported those efforts in that manner. Um, I, I also want to uh, get directly to your question about um, other supports and porta potties and such. We were providing um, AFC with spaces in the lot behind Wheelworks. Gavin would be able to tell you the lot number for that, but uh, <laughs> we. Um, we, we allowed for it there, and um, we um, had both the, the offered that offered the spaces free of charge, and we paid for the um, porta potty servicing. Mm -hmm. um, I do not know if we were providing direct support in terms of monetary contributions to AFC before that time. I don't believe that we were, but. I cannot guarantee I'm, I'm that, just trying to get to the point that... Off street. Those were off street. Yeah, so we to, to me, it. it's a fundamental difference between not enforcing and, you know, not allowing people to be anywhere and now actively providing designated spaces, services, support. Uh, to me, that's categorically different, and it's a step that we have not taken before. And I think that's... That is, that is correct. Yeah, the... The scale of what we had allowed was not something that we were doing, and it was just one lot. I think it was a couple of vehicles that were there at the time during the pandemic. And there was a, another comment made about um, the OVO reducing coastal access, and I'm just, I think I understand what was being said, but, but the idea, I think, is that OVO allows coastal access for more people, for, for different people, the, the public that's coming to visit town, that's coming to you know, not necessarily be you know, 
uh, staying here as as residents, but I I'm not sure that that's where it was going. Um, I think I'll just leave it there. But um, thank you very much, uh, John. I just want to acknowledge that line of thinking. Like I've served here for many years, and it feels like for 20 years I've been talking about a a pump out station on the west side, mm -hmm. like literally since I was on the public works commission. Yep. So like with love and respect for the city, like. We never wanted to allow parking lot parking. We did that. We're over it. I mean, I don't want the pump out station next to my house, but it sure would be nice to get that done at some point. I, I really felt the testimony of the people talking about how hard it was to like, oh, I don't want to drive, you know, to back and forth that many times. So the, the root of that pump out thing, I know it's very hard, but it has not been solved and it's still just there. But this gives me hope. Like we've changed in the last ten years a lot, so that's good. We should keep it up, Mike. Okay, I'm going to move uh, that we, or I'm sorry, I'm going to move the staff recommendation based on the findings and the conditions of approval, inclusive of our revisions and five new conditions of approval. Do we have a second? I'll second. All right, any further discussion? Well, I just wanted to mention that I do support John's um, pump station idea and trying to find out how the county can pay for it if it is going to be in the city. So I just want to make that distinction because I think he was I'm pretty sure we, we asked him once if we could be in the parking lot of the county building and they were not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do. Uh, have sensitivity about having to drive into the county and out of the city and what that entails in order to do that. So, um, but I do support the continued effort to try and find a way to, to solve that. And just, if I can just clarify something. I'm just trying to get to the point that the, the people are having trouble with the housing all over. It's not just in the city. It's not just on the west side. I'm, I'm just saying that it would be great if there could be more than one. It doesn't have to be one. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if over at the, the, the bus depot, you know, I, there are probably infrastructure-oriented sites where we could try to incorporate something that might be, a you know, an added service. Um, also, before we're, we adjourn the meeting, I'd like to welcome or two new right. commission oh, yeah. members. Our next item is a nomination of chairperson, so Great. we can uh, have more speech following that. Thanks too. very much. <laughs> Good. I'd, Julie. I'd like to um, also just um, note and also follow up on some of what the um, members of the public were saying. First of all, it is such a relief that we are providing places to park. and. You know, in my mind, there should be absolutely adequate place that everybody should know where they can safely park and have access to basic facilities. Shouldn't be complicated. Um, you know, and I, I think it is the we. I can't say enough about how important the safe parking programs should be. Um, I wish they were simpler. I wish that there were more of them. I wish there was more space for them. Why aren't there more parking lots? Um, um, but one thing I, I do disagree that um, with one comment that I don't I think the OVO and safe parking are both important and the OVO um, provides a way to enforce and make the community feel to address a whole bunch of needs and um, I hope that there's opportunity for it to continue to evolve um, some of the points that were made up through um, that people brought up through letters like the boat, for instance, not being able to park a boat on the street. Um, it just, all of the, all, I think it should be um, continuing to evolve. And there's gonna be um, ongoing stakeholder meetings. And the idea of those in my mind should be that this program keeps on getting better. Um, Cause I, I do think that that's really important. Um, and also, I just think I, I love all of the pictographic, um, you know, explanations of what's going on with services. It's a lot easier to understand than, you know, a million pages of text. Nice job. Um, <laughs> um, 
But I also feel like um, there should be public discussion about what's going on here. Because one of the things I think people don't understand, speaking only for my neighborhood, which has a lot of nice people in it, um, but I don't think there's any passing thought about what it means to call to get, um, you know, um, someone who's living in a van, not even an OVO, who's, you know, parked in the neighborhood, um, what it means to come and have that car towed, you know, or that van towed, and um, what it means in terms of cost and disruption. And um, I don't, I mean, I think the person who made that call, um, I don't, I don't want to diminish their inconvenience. Um, of, of having a vehicle parked on the street, um, but I do think there's a lack of understanding of what the impact is. And so public outreach and public participation and um, some you know, information about what's going on and just really take a minute and say, yeah, we have, we have safe parking. It's not enough, um, it's not good enough. I hope it keeps on getting better, but I, I just want people to understand that, that it's the whole community that's involved in addressing this. Um, and that's all of the burden shouldn't be on um, people who are unhoused who already have it hard enough. That's my thought. All right. Well, I just say let's remind Coastal about our housing success. I love seeing that on the slide there. I think that's really <laughs> helping long term too. Not immediately, but long term. Um, good. With that, I'd like to call for a vote. Commissioner Conway? Aye. Dan? Yes. Gordon? Yes. McKelvey? Yes. Paul Amos? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. So the motion passes unanimously with all commissioners in favor. Uh, thank you. So now we'll move on to our general business. Our next item is. Uh, nomination and election of the chairperson and vice chairperson. Uh, before we dive into that, I brought a little exhibit. I don't know if Tess can pop that up onto the big screen for us, or Tim? Yeah, it's, uh, it's here, Tess. Over. So okay. a year ago, I was appointed chair in Zoom, and then we had our first in-person meeting. So I prepared this little exhibit about how much like housing we were gonna build or approve this year, not build, approve this year. So a lot of you actually weren't here a year ago, which is interesting, but uh, <laughs> that's where we started the year, 219 units. Next slide. That's where we ended the year. So I love this. You know, this is not about quantity, it's about quality, but particularly like receiving this criticism about not building enough affordable housing over and over and over again, and having election after election, we just approved us up here 29 percent affordable last year and we're down from our last arena cycle which was 53 percent so i don't know when i see that i say let's continue our successes we've done one third of downtown we just crushed it on the middle section talk about affordable housing triumphs for a city of our size give me a break let's have a parade and let's keep it up and finish off that next third it should be easy and if we can hit 30% and like approve this much roughly for seven years and then throw in some that we never see, you know, that just go straight through the zoning administrator or we never see them, we could build that RENA goal, you know, if we just keep doing that. So there's more at stake here, like the global economy and things like that. But uh, I just want to present that. That makes me really proud. And I added the, the planning department too, because it's not just us, it's, it's all of you too. Um, so I just wanted to share that before we have nominations for the new chair. Nice. Yeah. yeah. What's next week's PowerPoint going to be? I don't know. <laughs> Who, who's going to be the next chair? Let's see if they can uh, pass that goal. Can I nominate uh, Commissioner Conway? I'd be happy to second that nomination. All those in favor of Commissioner Conway? Chair? Aye. 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 Yay. Uh, do we have a nomination for Vice Chair? Uh, I'd like to nominate Commissioner Paul Hamas. I'll second that. All those in favor of uh, Commissioner Paul Hamas as Vice Chair? Aye. 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 
Great. With that, we have a new chair and a new vice chair. Um, cool. Let me know if I can help. You, know, if you, you don't need my help, Julie. I think you got it, but um, how exciting. So, yeah, welcome to our new um, commissioners. We're excited to have you. I totally feel excited. like we have the dream team, and uh, <laughs> we could just approve projects, but if anyone wants to do subcommittees or, I mean, I'm thinking of the architectural <laughs> talents sitting around here and yeah. being like, maybe we can have material boards at the planning commission. You know? <laughs> so I'll just throw that out We're there. We're supposed to moving forward. Yeah, I don't think. the gavel <laughs> over. <laughs> they just can't mean anything or be decided on. Well, That's you know, right. there's got to be a way to get things that are just flat stuck it with vinyl. Yes. So. Pete, thanks for all your hard work. You're welcome. Yeah. Thanks Thank for you. doing doing the hard job. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's not an easy year. And, uh, we had a lot. We had, did, did you see my little chart? We had 18 meetings. You know, it was a busy year. Oh, we did the transit part too. We did the rail trail. You know, the parking and bike stuff. That's 70 percent of our carbon footprint. So, all right, I'll stop. Um, any other information items? How are we looking on schedule? Yes. Thank you. Um, and. Um, I just, you know, want to start by one welcoming the new commissioners and two applauding the work of the commission over the the last year, as you were highlighting here. Um, there were some challenging meetings, um, but we got a lot done. Um, I didn't realize we had eighteen meetings. Um, and, uh, <laughs> uh, but you know that is a very regular schedule, and um, when you all are busy, uh, it's a good thing. It means you know we're getting housing built and we're helping businesses open and we're bringing investment into the community. So thank you for your volunteering to be a, a part of that and the value that you bring to that. Um, all right. Next, speaking of uh, bringing um, businesses into the community, um, at our next planning commission meeting on the 15th, two weeks from now, we have the cruise hotel scheduled. That's the northeast corner of um, Laurel and Front. Um, we anticipate having a cannabis retailer use permit at the former Emily's Bakery on March 7th coming before you. And then um, coming soon thereafter or at some point in March likely um, is the outdoor dining on private property that we would be to you for changes. Um, Upcoming at City Council, some things that you would be interested in. Um, the 900 High Street project, the 40 units behind Peace United Church, that was appealed. And we have that going to our February 13th meeting of the City Council. We also have on that meeting a legislative update. So annually, we aim to update the City Council on the new legislation that took effect um, that year from the, the prior legislative cycle. And so- Excuse me, Lee, you, that was the 13th? That's correct, yes. Um, so um, you know, we will uh, focus on things that are likely to have the, the biggest effect here in Santa Cruz. And um, I'm sure we'll all be talking about those bills more as the year progresses, but it's good to get a, a head start on those. There are lots of sites where you can usually law firms that are uh, providing summaries and we'll be attaching one of those law firm summaries as well as providing some of our own local context in the staff report so i encourage you to take a look at that or just google it you can you can get all the housing laws uh, from the last year on a lot of those sites um i wanted to give you a heads up we did you all at your last meeting approved the food bin project and we did receive two appeals for that and so that will be headed to the city council That'll likely be in March when that moves forward. And then uh, that's it for the upcoming items. Quick updates on uh, the busy meeting that council had on the 23rd. Um, we had uh, four land use related items um, and ADU accessory dwelling unit urgency ordinance was extended and the commission will see that ordinance along with some related changes coming forward later this year for um, accessory dwelling units, likely in the summer, fall time frame. Um, Lee, while you're there, I'm trying to remember the number. AB 2307 requires jurisdictions to kind of do like a pre-built ADU thing? Yes, that's so pre-approved plans. 
approved plans. Do you know if anything's happening with that? Are we going to do that or just ignore it? Or I'm interested no, in that. No, we, we will be. Um, <laughs> I, 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 there's so many of them. I, I well, l that. let me just say we are and we will be. So, we already have um, one, yeah. So, so what, um, you know, give a little context without you know, diving so into too, too much. Deep, yeah. uh, we were one of the first um, yeah, jurisdictions to have pre-approved ADUs um, back in the early 2000s. Um, as the code cycles change, as you all know, every three years the code cycles change, that became challenging. We also found that, you know, they, they weren't used as often as we had hoped because people wanted, you know, changes here or there. Um, so back history, currently what we allow is if a applicant gets an ADU approved on a site and, you know, that architect wants, wants to bring forward uh, the same ADU for another site, we have we can limit the fees associated with that mm -hmm. and uh, limit the plan check. So there's still site specific things that need to be evaluated: soils, uh, you know, the utility connections, and so forth. But if we've already done the structural, we've already done the energy envelope. You know, it's um, it, it makes the process faster. So we do that now. What the new state law requires is to actually post a website that. Um, gives an opportunity for uh, architects and designers to post those plans. So it's kind of like the, the Amazon of uh, ADUs, right? <laughs> like each city would say, here's the, uh, here are the ADUs that have been approved. You know, they've gone through plan check. You're still gonna have to do some of these other site specific things, but take a look. And so if an architect wants to post that information, then a member of the community can go in and say, hey, here are 10 plans. Yeah. I really like this one. You know, this one fit in my backyard. Um, so that, that makes it more accessible. I still have great hope for that eventually working. Um, yep. That's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Question. Does some of the uh, housing modifications to the ordinance you're talking about, does some of it has to do, have to do with uh, conforming our policies and our ZO to uh, state, the state laws, like vis-a-vis -vis the owner occupancy? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. And so, in fact, um, you know, the reason why it's an urgency ordinance is because not this last cycle, but the one before that, you know, the the state, we the, they, the governor signs these bills in September, sometimes October. I think it was actually October of that year, and um, we're supposed to get it to planning commission and then to two readings of council before. <laughs> November, it's like with noticing deadlines, it's like almost impossible because the, the ordinance doesn't take effect until 30 days after the second reading. And so it's it's really challenging to actually get it done on time. And the ADU laws at the state level say if you're not in compliance, then your whole ADU code is scrapped and the state law takes precedent. We actually have um, additional flexibility in our code above and beyond the state law, and so we don't want to lose those. And so right now we're still operating under that urgency ordinance, but we will be coming back and doing some updates, um, not only to the owner occupancy requirement, which this year was eliminated, not to uh, 2025. That's so right ongoing. as of December, it was yeah, yeah. ADUs uh, as of uh, 2020 through January 1 of 2025 had no owner occupancy requirement. That was that 2025 deadline was eliminated. So anything going forward will not have an owner occupancy requirement. Our intent is to Thank bring. Thank you. How much discussion went into that fight? You, I think you, it was before you were talking about a lot of discussion, yeah. and then here the stage just like blows it away. You know? <laughs> And so our, our intent is to bring an ordinance before you that not only um, recognizes that, but also looks um, in the past and would allow for owners to remove the owner occupancy requirement on um, ADUs that were constructed pre-2020 from, from an equity issue, right? It's, you know, folks that had it before. So the ones that are deed restricted, you're saying there's going to be an avenue moving forward? That is what we are propose that is what we will be proposing based on the latest state laws. Interesting. Okay. I mean there's gonna be well, I what I think we counted there's like forty people, but those forty passionate people are gonna be pretty excited. <laughs> yes. Because they kinda got screwed for doing the right yeah. thing pretty hard. Yeah. Uh similarly the I can't remember the name of the 
state law, but the bill, but um, the one on condom or on uh, ADU sales. Yes, condominium. Is there some dis discussion? Is that coming forward, or is it? That will be something that we discuss, um, and you know, without getting into uh, too much detail because this isn't on the agenda, I will I will give you a teaser so that you all can noodle on it in the interim. Um, the the the, uh, the pros of that are it it can encourage home ownership and uh, have sort of a stepping stone into. Um, uh, gaining equity, um, a con to that could be the potential eviction of tenants if if someone is looking to um, to convert that. So we can't have a, a back a, a yeah, yeah. big fair discussion enough, on enough. that. Yeah. But I would I would welcome if you have ideas and you'd like to reach out to me. I, we've already been brainstorming some ideas internally and, and have have some thoughts about how to address that. But that's a teaser for some of that and. And please do reach out with ideas because Absolutely. that that will help Thank us um, as we move forward. Okay, um, four other excuse me, Ooh. three other uh, quick items. Uh, <laughs> the council on 123 also approved um, modifications to the objective standards that were approved by the Coastal Commission, and uh, that has two readings. So that'll come back uh, for a second reading in February, and then um, the objective standards will take effect in the Coastal Commission upon the Coastal Commission's acceptance of our modifications as of March. Um, it's the 12th or 13th or 14th. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that is very exciting, and a lot of work went into that. And then, um, the, similarly, the Coastal Commission made some very minor amendments to the downtown plan changes that this commission saw in September um, related to uh, 15 feet of additional height um, for um, rooftop um, amenities and um, some other related changes. They made a minor change. We brought that to council. They approved it. So that is going to uh, count, or excuse me, to the Coastal Commission on, uh, at their February meeting. So that will take effect then. And then lastly, um, the last item on the 23rd, the council accepted a report from a third party consultant, Kaiser Marston, on Measure M and the impacts of Measure M. Uh, we, as you know, Measure M would require a vote of the people for zoning or general plan um, height or floor area ratio increases, and it would increase the inclusionary rate from 20% to 25%. After accepting that, the re after accepting that report, the council voted uh, six to one to oppose Measure M. And that concludes my report. All right, excellent. So with that, I will adjourn this meeting of the Planning Commission. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you.